This diagram shows what environmental control and life support system looks like to an engineer. Uh, you know, as, as uh, spaceflight engineers, we like to look at block diagrams, input, output. Here we've basically turned the uh, ECLSS into a block diagram. And the interesting thing, I think, is that you notice the humans are right in the center of that diagram. So we're actually going to be treating humans as input-output elements in the entire system where we have certain input requirements and we put out certain outputs. And in order to actually make models of all of this, we need to be able to put some numbers on all these things. We are engineers, after all. And uh, this is one example. This came out of the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center uh, ECLIS group. You'll see other tables like this, the numbers change slightly, but it's important to get some sense of how much oxygen, how much water, and so on a human being needs on a typical day in space. And you can see that here, the oxygen coming in, the carbon dioxide going out, and so on and so forth. One thing that I want to caution you about when you look at tables like this, notice we have uh, quite a lot of water going here for showers, for washing clothes, for washing dishes. Um, in fact, uh, really the showers, clothes, and dishwater <laughs> account for 20 out of the roughly 30 kilograms of daily use water every day. And yet, we don't actually take showers in space. We tried it back in the uh, Skylab program. There's Pete Conrad inside a it's an incredible uh, device. It was a big cylindrical tube. You had to get in there, and, and of course, there's no the gravity isn't making the water come down, so you have to have a fan to sort of pull the water from the, the top to the bottom. But then, of course, you have the mist of the water floating around, and so you actually had to wear an air mask. And it was just so much trouble, and it took so much time that, that they decided it wasn't worth it. And so, since then, we've always just used kind of a washcloth to take a bit of a sponge bath, and then it keeps you uh, clean enough. So the other thing is, of course, we don't wash our clothes in space. Uh, that's something we don't currently recycle. Uh, when, they're, when they get too dirty, you just put them in a uh, resupply vehicle. When it leaves the space station, it burns up in the atmosphere, and that's the end of your dirty clothes. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, easier than washing them, but if we're going to go to Mars and we can't resupply the clothes, then uh, sooner or later we're going to have to figure out a way to wash them. And so, again, the environmental control and life support system requirements are heavily dependent on the nature of the mission that we're carrying out. So, let's start looking in more detail at the processes by which we take the human needs, our consumables, and we turn them into waste products. And what do we do with them? Clearly, we want to have a balanced diet, if at all possible. The uh, caloric requirements really depends on how much work you're going to do. On fairly short shuttle missions, uh, often people didn't exercise that much. You spent a lot of time just floating around, which doesn't use a lot of energy. So you maybe didn't need quite so many calories. But if you want to stay healthy for a long duration space flight on the station, you have to exercise a lot. We'll talk about that in a future lecture. Uh, and so your caloric requirements will go up. Now this is a picture of what most people, when they think of astronaut food, I think they still have the image of uh, everything in very small dehydrated packages. And this, in fact, is old space food. It's what people ate back in the 60s and, and, and early 70s. Things have gotten a lot better, I have to say. Uh, but a lot of the food still is dehydrated, and so are our drinks. We have water dispensers, uh, both in the Russian and US segments of the International Space Station, with hot and cold running water so that we can rehydrate our food. And I have to say, one of the biggest things that has happened is the development of uh, MREs for the military, meals ready to eat. These are real food. They're not dehydrated. They, they, the, you know, a piece of meat is a real piece of meat, and a vegetable is a real vegetable, and they're in, usually packed with some sauce or gravy. They're uh, thermostabilized, radiation-stabilized, so that they have a long shelf life, 
And uh, you know, poor soldiers out on the field may have to eat them cold, but I, I have to say up on the space station and on the shuttle, uh, there there uh, are ovens so you can actually heat the MREs up and, and have hot food for dinner. And things have gotten better. Here's a picture from uh, my fifth and final shuttle flight with an international crew, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz from Costa Rica, Claude Nicolier from Switzerland. So uh, this was about as, as good as it gets. We had uh, an MRE sirloin steak with uh, potatoes au gratin, uh, asparagus, dehydrated, Costa Rican coffee, um, nice Parmesan cheese, because we also had an Italian astronaut on board, Swiss chocolate, uh, and you can see white table linen. We had classical music playing in the background. So maybe not a three-star restaurant by Michelin standards, but uh, it's uh, not nearly as bad eating space food as people might think it is. You know, when we talk about providing uh, a good environment for astronauts, I've been concentrating mostly on the physical environment, you know, oxygen to breathe, food to eat, water to drink, and so on. But a proper psychological environment is also important uh, for maintaining the psychological health and the ability of the astronauts to continue to work at a, at a high pace. So. Having nice food, which uh, gives you a certain amount of variety and is tasty, is very important for the psychological health of astronauts as well as providing them with the nutrition that they need. We've done some experiments with growing plants in space. And certainly, uh, if you could have some nice lettuce uh, and salad greens, it would provide a lot of uh, variety and, and I think be psychologically uh, and physically satisfying. But the volume and energy uh, in spacecraft, even on the International Space Station, is, is so limited that to grow enough food that you could use it to supply your entire diet is something we, we really can't do. On the other hand, if we ever establish a, a base on Mars and you could actually build a large volume greenhouse, then perhaps we could talk about growing uh, most of the food we need because bringing the food all the way from the Earth to Mars is going to be very, very expensive indeed. And of course, here's the question which everybody would like to ask but is sometimes a little bit embarrassed, which is how do you go to the bathroom in space? But, you know, we're human beings. We drink water, we eat food, we have to get rid of it. The big difference between a space toilet and a toilet on the Earth is gravity to make everything go down into the toilet. So you actually have to replace gravity with airflow. So for liquid waste, we have this little tube here, and then there's, on the end of it, you have your own little end effector, I'll call it, which uh, goes different shapes for men and women. And there's a flow through that tube. You urinate into it, and the urine goes uh, either, in the case of the shuttle, into a holding tank before it's dumped overboard, or in the case of the space station, which we'll look at later, into a urine recycling unit. For solid waste, around the little hole here, there are little air holes, and so you place yourself on the seat, you make a tight seal, and then you have a little bit of air blowing. It's a little bit of a funny feeling, feeling all this air going over your, uh, your rear end, but you get used to it. The other thing is, of course, you have these little thigh bars which are on springs and you pull those and then you pu push them down on your thighs to hold you against the seat because you can imagine what would happen if you started floating up in the middle of doing your business. But it is an important part of the environmental control and life support system. Whatever comes in must go out and we'll leave it at that.